Hi, Chris. How are you doing, by the way? Good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing very well, by the way. Thank you so much for joining us today. And it's a pleasure to have you all here. And I believe a lot of people can take advantage. They can hear about you. And almost everyone knows you, but there are certain people who knows less about you. So I believe it would be really good for them as well. Yeah. Let me introduce myself. I'm Chris yeah. Webb. Um, I've got a new job title recently. Um, I used to work on the Power BI customer advisory team. I now work on the Fabric customer advisory yeah. team. So yeah. we're Fabricats, um, which is, uh, I think it's a pretty cool name. I think Fabricat is kind of a little bit more fun than Power BI Cat. Um, and I do, well, I mean, if I can describe myself relative to um, Adam and Patrick, if you know what Adam Saxon does, yeah. I do for Europe and the rest of the world what he does for America. Um, right. So the Fabricat team uh, looks after large customers, helps them be successful with Fabric now. Um, we solve problems um, and then also collect a lot of feedback. We spend about 50% of our time talking to the, the program managers who build Microsoft Fabric, providing feedback, um, telling them what customers are thinking, what works, what doesn't work, um, what should be prioritized. Um, generally, we're the voice of the customer on the Fabric mm -hmm. team. Fabric is an amazing project uh, product, to be honest. And I was so surprised. I was in the close group, but then we were calling it something else. And then suddenly it came out out of the blue and then LinkedIn was flooded with all the news and everything. And now everyone is talking about Microsoft Fabric. So uh, please tell us something more about Microsoft Fabric. Like what is it? And if I'm going to talk about related to Power BI, then how it's going to impact the current users? Sure. I mean, I would say it's probably interesting to talk about what Fabric means for, for Power BI users. Um, yeah. I mean, Fabric is a gigantic topic, but Indeed. if you're coming at it from a, a kind of Power BI point of view, I've seen a lot of people say, well, I'm confused. There's too much information. What does it mean for me? Um, yeah. And probably the, the first thing to say is that it, it doesn't need to mean anything. Um, yeah. You know, we're not taking anything away from you. Um, if you want to carry on using Power BI in the way that you have before, that's absolutely fine. Um, a lot of the things we're doing, you know, will just carry through and you'll still be able to um, you know, use Power BI and get all the cool new features. You know, you'll still get lots and lots of cool things for Power BI um, going forward in the way you have in the past. So it could be that you just don't care. That nothing's changed. You'll see a different logo. Um, you'll see a lot more stuff going on or options in your workspace, but it doesn't need to be anything. Um, but there are, if you do start to use Fabric, I think mm -hmm. there are going to be a couple of useful, interesting things that that might tempt you into using, uh, you know, in, into doing it. Um, probably the first thing to talk about, the obvious big new thing for Power BI that comes with Fabric is this thing called Direct Lake. Um, yeah. Now, in the past, in Power BI, there were two fundamental storage modes, two ways of working with data. You had import mode and direct query mode. Right. With import mode, you're, you know, importing the data from your data source and loading it into um, Power BI, loading a copy of it into there. Um, the good things about that mean are that it is it gives you fast query performance, gives you access to all of the features of Power BI, all of that good stuff. The bad thing is that you've got a separate copy of your data inside Power BI, and when yeah. the data in your source changes, you've got to do that refresh, and that refresh could take quite a long time. Right. Um, direct query mode, you run a report, Power BI generates SQL queries or whatever against the data source, uh, gets the data on demand, which means you don't have that latency problem with import mode, but then you know, you've got the potential uh, okay. of performance problems. Now, yeah. Direct Lake is something quite similar to import mode. Um, in import mode, you've still got that, you've got that in-memory column store database, and right. in Direct Lake mode, you've got exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. So there are a few subtle differences, but basically once you're using Direct Lake, you've got the same in-memory column store database and you've still got the same great report performance. So you've got that you know, benefit of using uh, import mode in Direct Lake mode. The difference is you don't have to import the data. Yeah. Um, you don't have to wait for Power BI to refresh its data set. Mm -hmm. When you've got your data stored in a lake house in Fabric, yeah. um, in Delta format, um, Power BI can simply take that table, 
and then magically load it directly into its in-memory console database super, super quickly. I mean, really, really fast and just import bits of it, not the whole of it. Um, yeah. So that means that instead of you know, having to wait for your data to import, if the data is in the lake house, well, you've got a lot of the benefits of import mode without that latency and having to refresh the data. Now, yeah. you're going to pay the, you know, you've still got to import the data into the lake house. So there's always going to be overhead there. Um, right. But a lot of people are already building lake houses. So yeah. if you're already doing that, then you know that last mile of getting the data into Power BI is just now instant. You know, in the past, if you were building a lake house, you might have to put like a Synapse dedicated pool or an Azure SQL database or something on top of it. You know, load the data into that and then load the data into Power BI, which is you know, a bit of a pain. With Direct Lake, you've got your data in the lake. It's there in Power BI automatically. So that, that's a, a big thing. And of course, yeah. if your data is there in the lake, other people can consume it. People can run SQL queries against that data. You know, right. Data scientists can reuse that data as well. So that I think is, is the main thing people are getting excited about with Fabric, um, if you're right. a Power BI person. Yeah, so does that mean that we can overcome all the limitations that we were having in the past when using the direct query? Because lately I also saw one of your video where you talked about the direct query and how to optimize it and how to use it in a right way in any organization. Now, with the introduction of this direct leak, so can I say that we can overcome all those challenges in a better way and we can even build a better data model or better power data reports with a huge amount of data in the data lake or something like that? Um, well, I mean, I think we, yes and no. There are still going to be some use cases for direct lake. That's sorry, for direct query. Um, mm -hmm. For example, not building a lake house, you are building a you know, relational data warehouse on some other platform. You know, I don't want to name names, but if you're not yeah. doing everything end to end in fabric and nobody yeah. is yet, um, you might already be going down the route of building a, you know, a relational data warehouse on some other platform and then you know, direct query on that, or at least a, you know, a composite model aggregate with aggregations and things. Um, that's still very relevant. Um, if you've got really, 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 really real time requirements, yeah. Direct query is still very relevant as well because you probably don't want to have that latency of loading the data into the lake and then updating it and then you know, direct lake from there. So you know a lot of the scenarios, for example, you might use Azure Data Explorer for where you've yeah. got huge amounts of data, but it's changing and updating all the time. Right. You're still going to need to use direct query on top of you know, Azure Data Explorer yeah. for things like that as well. Yeah, of course. And it's definitely going to change a lot of things that people used to do it. But let's suppose in an organization where we already have one Azure subscription that people are using, and then we have built the uh, SNPs warehouse over there. We have a data lake as well. And now with the introduction of uh, Microsoft Fabric, then what are going to be the changes over there? Do we also need to pay separately for direct lake and then to Azure as well? So how we are going to consider that, uh, what changes we can expect over here? So I think the important thing to emphasize is that if you're already invested in Synapse, that's not going away. We're not turning it off in three months. Um, we don't operate like that with Microsoft. You know, we support things for a very, very long time. Um, yeah, and we are indeed. very, very serious about that. That's what enterprises expect. Certain of our competitors are notorious for introducing products and then turning them off with like three months notice. Yeah. That's not the way we work. You know, And if you want proof, I'm a, an old, SQL Server Analysis Services multi-dimensional person, which to yeah. be honest, hasn't received any significant updates since around 2010. And that's still there. It's still in every version of SQL Server. It's still updated. It's not deprecated at all. Um, you know, you can, there are still a lot of people out there using it. So, you know, we are going to be supporting and um, you know, possibly making some changes to Synapse for a, a long, long, long time to come. So your architecture is not out of date. Um, now, you might want to start to take advantage of um, Fabric, and yeah. we've we are we're not ready to reveal our plans yet. But you know, we're aware that people want a migration path; they want a kind of best together story as well. So we are thinking very seriously about um, our plans there as well. Now let's talk about Power BI because Fabric is altogether is a super exciting product, and even for me, I'm reading all the documentations, I'm watching your blogs and, and die in a cube. Everyone is posting a lot of content and it's super exciting. But there are two things uh, majorly to talk about. One is Copilot, which is in Power BI now and which is going throughout the Power Platform uh, mm -hmm. in steps, let's say. So 
currently it's in strict private preview if I'm not wrong over here. But when people can uh, expect that this is going to be in the public preview or something as any timeline or anything, because they are super excited to try that out. Yes, um, I can't provide any timelines, but it will be in the medium term, I think. Um, um. I, you know, there has been a lot of excitement about Copilot. A lot of people, you know, every day people have been kind of messaging me saying, oh, can I get on the private preview and things? You know, you can't. It, it's still too early. Um, but, you know, it, it will be, yeah, it will be soonish that you'll be able to get your hands on it, I promise. Um, and yeah, there are going to be all kinds of, if you've watched the videos, you can see there are all kinds of really exciting things that um, we're going to do, helping it, helping it to make it easier to write DAX code or you know Python or SQL or whatever, depending on what you know what you want to do. And um you know, automatically building and laying out reports for you. Um I think if you're someone like me who is visually challenged and is not great at laying out reports, just using Copilot to get that first draft of the layout, it'll just make everything you know, so much yeah, you know, it, it that first draft will be so much better than anything that I could build. Right. So Cliff, you just mentioned visually challenged. So can you just uh point out a little bit more about the accessibility for other people that who are using like in their day-to-day -day work there are lots of people who use the report and then we have so many accessibility features in microsoft power bi as well so uh, if you can well i mean when i say i'm visually challenged that means that i am not really very good at building reports right. uh, making pretty <laughs> nice looking reports um so i'm not Jet, apart from being a bit short-sighted and needing three different pairs of glasses, <laughs> I'm not really visually challenged. I'm, I think, aesthetically challenged, which means that I, I'm not very good at, at building beautiful or functional reports. And so, yeah, Copilot is definitely going to help with that. Um, obviously, we do take accessibility very, very seriously, and right. actually, to be honest, I think a lot more seriously than some of our other competitors. Again, um, we've got you know, specialists in this area who take a, you know, do a, a lot of work to you know, support screen readers and, and things like that as well. So now we will go further and we'll think about the other type of audience as well, because there is a kind of a fear as well among some of the people that since the introduction of the copilot, there are certain group of people they are talking about, oh my god, AI is gonna take us our job over here because copilot you can simply you know connect with the data set and you can build any kind of report you want. And then maybe some part of uh, of them they are thinking, hey, we don't need any expert. And on the other hand, there's also one group who's talking about hey, now we don't need to write the decks. What about our expertise? Are we going to, you know, not do anything over there since the introduction of the copilot? So what would you like to say about that? All right. I don't think anybody is going to be out of the job like this, I promise. Um, I, I think it's going to be broadly similar. If, you, if you're if you somebody who's done a lot of reporting in Excel, you know, in the in the bad old days and for a lot of people still today, a lot of people have got this bit, this title of business, that job title of business analyst, uh, but their actual job is, you know, open up Excel, run some macros, copy and paste some data in, do some data munging, and then just spend their entire week building some report. Uh, but it's all kind of very manual work. You know, with Power Query and Power BI and all of these different things, this work becomes so much quicker and easier. Does it put those people out of a job? No, it means that they can actually do some data analysis rather than spending all of their time, you know, yeah. uh, getting their hands dirty, you know, building manual reports. And, you know, I think the same is true of Copilot. I don't think Copilot is going to put anybody out of the job. It just means that all of those rather boring, tedious manual tasks like, oh, here's a blank canvas. How am I going to turn this into a, a Power BI report? Yeah, it, it's just going to make it easier to, to get going. But Copilot isn't going to automatically understand your business requirements. It'll lay out a report, but it doesn't really know exactly what you want to see on that report. It doesn't yeah. know what your boss says. Um, and you know, it says, well, you know, I kind of like that, but this isn't working. You know, if your boss can't really express what it is that they want that's different, you know, your job is still to go there and talk to them and say, well, what about this? What about this? Do you like this? You know, I can do this. You know, it, it, it's not going to reply. I don't think it's going to replace anybody. It's going to replace a lot of the boring manual work, but, um, you know, it's not going to do anything. And as far as writing DAX goes, yeah. It, it's going to save time for someone like me, because if I'm sitting down writing some DAX, instead of having to stand up, grab my copy of DAX patterns or the definitive guide to get DAX from the shelf above, look in the index, flick through and think, mm, what's this? We'll spend a bit of time Googling, saying what, you know, what's the best pattern for this particular calculation. I can just type, it'll suggest something, and yeah, there we go. It, it, it'll give me a good first draft. Again, I'm not going to trust it to do an absolutely perfect job every time, because as we've seen, 
these things, you know, um, AI is still a long way from being perfect, yeah. but it, it'll just save me a lot of time getting that that first bit of code that I can then modify and make sure it works properly and everything else. Yeah, and I believe this is going to answer to the questions or queries for all other people who are going to watch this video that their jobs are going to still be there. They have to just do some of proofreading and it's just a helping hand rather than, you know, just completely replacing their job over there. And yeah. it happens like when we migrated from SSRS to Power BI, then it it was a very big change and people was so stunned with the new visualization and altogether interactivity and it was amazing. Yeah, now, exactly. We are going to talk about one very interesting question that I believe you get every time, thousands of times, and that is the Excel users. They are always, you know, a um, bit of stubborn because they are coming from a long background of using the Excel and they feel very comfortable with the Excel. And when bringing those people to Power BI, it's a bit of challenge. And I'm facing myself in our current organization where we have to convince them, but uh, I, I can convince. But what would you like to say to them that how Power BI literally can help them and from the Excel and still they can take the advantage of Excel as well if they would like to. Yeah, I mean, I, I was answering this question 20 years ago and I will be answering this question in 20 years time, probably until the day I die or at least the day I retire. Um, <laughs> I, I would say the first thing about this is that, you know, don't stress too much about it. You know, when Power BI people, BI professionals talk about this, it's it's a problem that has to be solved. You know, these people, they're stuck in the stone age. They need to get with it. Um, you know, I don't take that attitude at all. I mean, Excel is a great tool. The good thing about working for Microsoft is that people use Excel. Hey, you know, we make money from it as well. You know, it pays my salary as much as Power BI does. Yeah. So, you know, the last thing I want to do is just to tell these people they're idiots and they've got to move away from Excel. Um, you know, Excel is a great tool. There are a lot of reasons why people actively like to use Excel. Um, the way I would always want to have the conversation is, you know, to say, well, is there something you don't like about what you're doing with Excel? And maybe Power BI can help fix that. Because there are always things, like I said, there are those people whose um, entire week or months is spent munging data to build reports in Excel. And, you know, you might be used to doing it, but you might also realize that it's a bit boring and a bit manual and a bit tedious. And you might want to go on to do, have more time to do the more interesting parts of your job. Well, you know, let's have a conversation about that. What is it you don't like about yeah. the job you've got today? And, you know, maybe that's going to help people be motivated to learn about Power BI. It's right. like, well, you know, do you hate that those manual processes? Did you know you can automate them? Well, you know, you spend a bit of time learning Power BI. You can build your data set, build your report, set up the scheduled refresh. And look, there it is. Yeah. You know, you don't have to do all of that work. You can automate it really easily. Indeed, indeed. And that's what the magic of Power BI comes when we have to automate any kind of our day to day job. And it's going to be super helpful. Now, uh, if we talk about the Power BI, it's coming a long journey since the inception in 2015. Then we are seeing drastic change in the features, updates, and every month something new is coming. I follow each and everything, but still sometimes if I'm going on holiday or something and I'm missing, then it seems like, oh, I'm three months behind the schedule. That what's going on? Mm -hmm. So for the new Power BI users, like the freshers are coming out of their, you know, engineering programs, or let's say the new joiners who are changing their field and more and more people would like to change their career into the data field. So what would be your advice, Chris, over there, that how can they cope with this drastic change? Now Fabric has been introduced and there are so many new features are coming into Power BI. So how they can build up their career into this field? So uh, I think this is a very relevant question, especially now we've got Fabric, because that feeling yeah. of being completely overwhelmed is going to get worse and worse. Um, first of all, be aware that nobody knows everything. Um, anybody that says they knew everything about Power BI is a liar because nobody does. And in fact, if somebody said that they were a, you know, a Power BI expert and knew absolutely everything about them, I would know they were telling lies because yeah. you know, I, I know I've met some of the, you know, all of the, the leading Power BI people in the world and nobody yeah. knows everything. Um, I think all you need to do is, you know, pick on the area that you need to be able to do your job and then learn those skills and then maybe spread out from there. Um, it's always good to be have a vague awareness of what's possible. Like, for example, with Q&A and natural language querying, you can know that that's possible without needing to know absolutely all the details about um, how to use it, just so that you've got that as an option in case you do need to kind of use it on a project and start learning about it. So have a good general awareness of everything that's there in the product. But then yeah, if you want to learn it, perhaps pick some data that you're interested in. Um, start building some data sets and reports 
and then find the things that you enjoy doing because those are the things that you can then start to specialize in you know in any large-ish organization that uses power bi there will always be different degrees of specialization and you know maybe if you are a visual person you'll be the person who starts to get good at um designing reports and um you know understanding all the features and knowing what you can do with field parameters know what you can do with um you know all of the, the kind of cool visual features of power bi maybe you're one of those people who enjoys dax some people do they probably quite yeah. like dax cool. as well um maybe then you'll spend more time on your little project learning how to do certain calculations um yeah. and then that will be that'll mean that you're the person who is slightly better than everybody else at dax maybe you enjoy power query like i do yeah. um maybe then you'll be kind of more the, the etl data preparation data transformation person um you know you don't have to be an absolute guru at these things but it is useful to you know have a have certain areas where you're going to be better than others and yeah. you know, my opinion is always to find the things you're interested in find the things those will tend to be the things you're good at that you're more motivated to learn and you know it's it's fun find the things that are fun and um, then you'll get better at them more easily than trying to force yourself to learn absolutely everything yeah yeah of course so they have to start with somewhere and they just need to pick what area of power is going to interest you because Power BI is not just nowadays a uh, visualization or analytics tool. It's much more than that. It has proper ecosystem. I call it a Power BI ecosystem where we have so many external tools. And now with the introduction of Fabric, it's so much. And every yeah. organization actually needs uh, lots of Power BI different roles as well, whether it's a Power BI admin role, uh, backend designer, report designer, or Power BI architecture, solution architect. So I believe uh, everyone can explore their different areas. And according to their experience, they can go into that particular area. Exactly. And I, you know, I think going back to what we were talking about right at the beginning, um, one way of looking at fabric is to say that fabric is power BI. And in fact, yeah. in a lot of fundamental ways, it is power BI. It's power mm -hmm. BI with suddenly more and more workloads in it. You know, this time last year, power BI, well, you had data sets, you had data flows, um, you had paginated reports. Now fabric is just power BI with all of that stuff, plus warehouses, plus Spark plus yeah, you know, all kinds of other amazing things. Um, and you can imagine that there are gonna be just more and more new things added to that platform, more and more capabilities. It's a, you know, a gigantic ecosystem already. It's gonna get bigger and bigger. Yeah, and as you mentioned about that, they should pick any of the area and you mentioned Power Query. So all the users, or all the viewers who are using it, if you don't know about Chris Webb, I believe you already know, is the Power Query guru. So you must uh, visit his blog, which is by the name of CrossJoin. And over there, he posts all the related articles regarding Power Query and many, much more over there, where you will find more than 1,500 articles over there. Sometimes I thought, okay, I'm going to go to the each and every article, but it's not possible. It's a lot. <laughs> so wherever we need something related to that, we go over there and we get the right information. So now, uh, Chris, if we are going to talk about more in the Power BI, this ecosystem, using Fabric is going to be in the picture. And we, are, we were also talking about the Copilot over there. Um, now there's another part of the Power BI which we call Power BI Report Server, which is for the on-premise solution. So yeah. can we expect that Copilot or other changes are going to also be the part of, you know, Report Server in the future, or Copilot is only going to be the only Power BI service? I don't know for sure, but I would say with a fair degree of confidence that you're not going to get Copilot in Power BI Report Server, because Copilot is going to depend on other cloud services in the background. So, you know, yeah. we build Power BI in Fabric on azure depend on other azure services um right. and copilot is absolutely going to be like that so i don't think we're going to have some or all of these features you know, things in power bi desktop they'll, they'll probably work but i would not expect the whole of copilot and probably not the majority of copilot to be there in power bi report server all right so that's a actually this is a fair uh answer to all the people who are working on the paginated reports and all the power bi builder tool etc because it also needs an internet connectivity over there and when we talk about the on-premise then there are many restrictions over there which mm -hmm. we can we cannot incorporate over there yeah. i mean i all think right. our attitude to on-prem is that you know obviously we we have power bi report server and we still add features to it but sooner or later you know people are going to move to the cloud power bi is cloud first you know, a lot of the success of Power BI is down to the fact that it's cloud first. And, you know, we would like 
everybody using Power BI Report Server one day to be able to migrate to the cloud. I know it's not possible. I know there are regulatory reasons. I know things people are you know, worried about putting their data in the cloud. Some people can't put their data in the cloud, but you know, yeah. one day it is going to be possible. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely true. And myself, uh, I have faced so many questions from the viewers. They just commented out, "Hey, so are we, you know, uh, is there any problem with using the paginated reports or the Microsoft uh, Power BI server? Because uh, it's kind of like Microsoft is giving a special treatment to Power BI service rather than to report server. So what would you say about that? Like if you have to answer to this question, what you are going to tell to the audience? Well, I, I would first of all, make the distinction between paginated reports and Power BI report server. Because obviously if you've got paginated reports in the Power BI service as well, um, and yeah. we are, and I, I can say hand on heart, we are actively making a lot of investments in paginated reports still. There's a lot of cool stuff to come. Um, paginated reports, you know, they, they had a, a time when we were not so investing so much in them. Um, that is definitely changing. Um, there is a very active paginated reports team um, who are building you know, not only kind of feature parity with kind of on-prem paginated reports in the cloud, but thinking about adding lots of other cool new features to paginated reports. And this is fundamentally because, you know, there is a clear use case for paginated reports. You know, Power BI reports are great if you want to build beautiful, interactive, clicky reports, but yeah. sometimes people want to be able to export to PDF. They want long lists of things with, you know, kind of 10 pages on. Um, those are the types of use case that Power BI reports aren't good at and never will be good at. And that's what paginated reports are good at. That's not going away. People always want that. And that's what, you know, paginated reports will do. And so you know, we are still investing a lot in them. So you'll see not only all of the kind of old SSRS functionality slowly coming to paginated reports in the cloud, but other cool new things as well. Um, now, that's paginated reports. Power BI reports that are the on-prem version of you know, Power BI. That's a slightly different thing. Like I said, you know, we it's not going away. It's not deprecated, um, but we've made no secret of the fact, and I think we've got a blog post from a couple of years ago saying this quite, uh, you know, quite clearly, we are a cloud first product. We see more and more companies migrating to the cloud. Um, it makes sense for us to invest in the cloud as our primary product. Um, if there are features that we can bring to on-prem, that's great. But sooner or later, you know, everybody's going to be in the cloud. So we should be concentrating on that rather than doing on-prem features. Yeah, of course. And I believe this is going to answer to all the audience who are thinking about the future of report server or any of the paginated reports. So now you have your answer. Now talking about the cloud and the, the next question comes to the mind is the security. And there are certain banks when I was back in like 2018 in Singapore, when the cloud was at boom and still it's going on exponentially. There are certain banks who are not really willing to put their data on cloud. And I was in a team who was implementing Power BI with one of the number one digital bank over there. And still they were starting because I was there to implement to this adoption plan of Microsoft Power BI, but still there was so much concern about the steps they are making towards the cloud. And we know as a fact like me and you that Microsoft has so many measures for the security over there. But if I'll ask you, Chris, what would you advise to the people who would like to move to the cloud, but still they are a bit hesitant to go there? Yeah, I would say there are two types of concern. First of all, there is this general worry. There are no specific issues, but people are worried about, oh, you know, should I go to the cloud? Is it is it safe? Um, actually, there are three types. But yeah, the first type is that general unease. People say, well, you know, is it safe? I'm not quite sure. You know, perhaps I should just carry on doing what I should do, what I've been doing in the past. Yeah. You know, that's understandable. A lot of people are in that situation. But you know, looking at it from a Power BI point of view, we have a lot of banks, a lot of healthcare institutions, a lot of these, you know, people who are sitting there worrying about that, a lot of their competitors are already moving to the cloud and getting a competitive advantage about it. So if you're just generally concerned or distrustful, you know, be, be reassured or be scared by the fact that all of your competitors are moving um, and they're going to be able to you know, get all the cool new functionality in Power BI, for example, get a competitive advantage from doing that. So I don't think just general Ooh, I'm not sure we're ready yet is, you know, I can understand it, but I think it's something that um, people, you know, people should understand that, it, that everybody else is doing it. So why shouldn't you? 
Yeah, now, indeed. the next thing is perhaps regulatory. There are yeah. a lot of countries where even if you wanted to go to the cloud, you couldn't do it yet. Yeah. Um, and you don't have any control over that. So you just have to obey the rules. Um, right. Different countries have got different regulations, and that's fair enough. I think one of the good things about Microsoft is that because we are a global com company, um, we have people in every single country who understand those local regulations. And even if we are not able to you know, kind of reassure the authorities or you know, uh, ensure compliance yet, we are actively working on it. So um, yeah, we've got tons and tons of certifications. You know, we've got people who understand the all of the kind of compliance regulations and things. So you know, we are working very you know, steadily to to get all of the you know, compliance boxes ticked off. Uh, in some cases, it's just a matter of having data centers in particular Azure regions. You know, I know yeah. there are some countries in the Middle East, for example, where you can't put your data in the cloud because we don't have data centers there. We are building data centers all around the world. Um, and again, that will kind of help those regulatory issues uh, because suddenly you'll be able to have data in the cloud, but it stays in your country. Yes. So that's something else we're doing. And again, that's the advantage of working with Microsoft and Azure. We've got some of the best yeah, geographic coverage in the world. Yes. And then finally, there are kind of specific bits of functionality. There are going to be some people who say, oh, you know, I, I can't do this until you know, VNet Gateway is a GA. Um, and we hear a lot about that. Um, and yes, we are actively working to make sure that we have all of the relevant functionality Again, on the CAT team, we work with some of the largest enterprise customers in the world. So yeah. we hear we we hear a lot about those specific types of requirement. Um, sometimes it takes us quite a long time to be able to deliver them because these are not easy things to do. Um, and we have dependencies on other teams as well. But you know, we are again gradually going through understanding everybody's specific security concerns and requirements, ticking off all the boxes, and um, yeah, uh, and being able to kind of give you all of the security related functionality that you're asking for yeah great so i believe uh, everyone is getting their answer if they are still concerned about it or if they are confused which cloud version whether hybrid private or public cloud they have to go they can choose and even they are concerned about their local data related policies that how they can approach and i think it, it would be good to say that uh, contact Microsoft Sports Center. They can help you to clarify your concerns and they can help you that how you can approach towards your data solution. Yeah, Is that exactly. Your, your Microsoft account team should be able to help you if you're concerned yeah. about these things. Indeed. Now we are going to approach to our last question. So Chris, any piece of advice to the newcomers or individuals or the organizations who are just about to start their data analytics journey and now since the introduction of Fabric or there's a probably also standalone product, then what would you like to tell them and how they can start their journey with the end-to-end -end data analytics with Microsoft? Um, well, a couple of things. Um, first of all, a lot of people coming to kind of data analytics are not coming, you know, the, coming to kind of Microsoft's platform are not new to data analytics. Maybe they've got you know older BI tools that they've been using for a long time, not just Excel, but some of those other tools that I won't mention. Um, I think the important thing to understand if you move to Power BI and Fabric is you shouldn't look at this and try and recreate what you were doing in the past. Yeah. And this kind of goes back to the whole the, the discussion we were having earlier about Excel and export to Excel. You know, the, the old joke goes that you know, the most important bit of any BI functionality is import, export to Excel, and that, that's still absolutely <laughs> true. Um, but you know, if your old BI tool basically you know, ran a report emailed it out, yeah, exported a bunch of number, a big table of numbers to Excel, and then emailed that Excel spreadsheet out to everybody on a Monday morning. And then somebody's next job was to say, well, here's the new version of the numbers. I've got to plug that into a report. Now let me do copy and paste. That's, you know, try to recreate that in Power BI. Maybe it'll save you a bit of license money, but it's yeah, perpetuating all of those old inefficient bad practices. Um, so even though it can sometimes be a bit of a struggle, you've got to try and, um, Think about new, more efficient ways of working with data, and you know, look and see what Power BI can do to help you with that. You know, instead of exporting a gigantic table of data to Excel and then building the report on top of it, it's like, well, okay, maybe you can build a data set and then build your reports as well. 
um, yeah. instead of emailing out a big Excel file every Monday, well, you know, if you know the report you want to build, why don't you just build that report and say, hey, instead of getting an Excel file email to you, here's the link to the report. You can see it anytime you want. It's there on your monitor, it's on your tablet, it's on your phone. You know, um, you know, you don't have to accept that that kind of old rhythm of business. So don't don't be kind of imprisoned by the not not just the technology of the past, but the routines and the expectations that went with it. Because by completely rethinking your approach to BI, um, you, you'll get all of the benefits. Yeah. And you know, a very a very similar thing as well is this whole self service BI thing. Because again, in the past, BI was the domain of you know, IT people. You had to be yes. a, a you know a kind of you know, proper IT person in order to build a report, or you had to be that special person in the team who knew the data and was the only person allowed to build the reports on top of it. That kind of gatekeeping type of approach is you know, it, it, it's very inefficient um, and it's very limiting. And the more you can give people access to the data in a governed, you know, um, monitored, supported way, um, and, you know, giving people a certain degree of self-service freedom, maybe even just publishing a data set and saying, well, hey, go away and build your own reports on top of it. The more you can democratize access to data and analytics and things, um, the more you as an organization will achieve overall. Yeah, indeed. And thank you so much, Chris, for all this en enlightenment. And I believe people would consider this, all the different facts, and they would also gonna visit your blog. They would subscribe over there. Then they will get to know more about this, how the Power Query works, how the Power BI works, and how the Fabric is working over there. And uh, guys, if you haven't subscribed this channel, subscribe this now for more updates on Fabric. And also go to the Chris Webb's blog over there. I'm gonna provide a link in the description section. They, there you will find all the details about the Chris and, as well as his blog. And let us know if you have more questions uh, from Chris or to me, we are going to help you to answer those questions as well, probably in our next session. Uh, so with that, Chris, thank you so much for this insightful session on Microsoft Power and Microsoft Fabric. And I believe this is going to be a game changer <laughs> for any organization over there. Absolutely. I think so too. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.